your goodness. And Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. So earlier this week, I, I was studying and I came, I just had my, my Spotify on like a random shuffle of, of gospel music and this song came up that I hadn't heard in a really long time, but I, I grew up listening to it and it, you know when sometimes you hear a song that you haven't heard in a long time, it just, it just feels like exactly what you needed to hear in that moment. And so I've just been listening to this song on repeat the rest of the week. And so I thought I would share it with you this morning. Uh, it's called, Sometimes It Takes a Mountain. I faced a mountain that I've never faced before. That's why I'm calling on you, Lord. I know it's been a while, but Lord, please hear my prayer. I need you like I never have before. Sometimes it takes a mountain Sometimes a troubled sea Sometimes it takes a desert To get a hold of me Your love is so much stronger than whatever troubles me. And sometimes it takes a mountain to trust you and believe. Forgive me, Jesus, I thought I could control whatever life would throw my way. But this, I will admit, has brought me to my knees. I need you, Lord, and I'm not ashamed to say yeah. sometimes it takes a mountain sometimes a troubled sea sometimes it takes a desert To get a hold of me 
Your love is so much stronger Than whatever troubles me Sometimes it takes a mountain To trust you and believe. Let's sing that one more time. Sometimes it takes a mountain. Sometimes it takes a mountain. Sometimes a troubled sea. Sometimes it takes a desert. To get a hold of me Your love is so much stronger Than whatever troubles me Sometimes it takes a mountain Trust you and believe. Sometimes it takes a mountain to trust you and believe. Dear Lord, this morning, God, we just praise you. God, we are so thankful that we are able to gather in this place with our, with our brothers and sisters. And God, we are able to just come sit at the foot of your throne, God, and just bring you praise. God, this morning, I just pray that, God, your spirit would just continue to dwell here in this place. God, I pray that you would open our minds, open our hearts. Open our eyes to what you have for us this morning. God, I pray that you would just use Pastor Rick. God, give him the words to say and the message to convey. God, we thank you so much for your son, Jesus. God, it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, I hope and pray you guys are um, at least uh, getting as on fire as I am. Um, as we get closer and closer to Resurrection Sunday, uh, which is the big event on the Christian calendar, isn't it? I mean, it is the big thing. And as, uh, as we're progressing through those days of that week, that, uh, that Passion Week, that Holy Week, uh, that uh, week of Jesus' uh, ministry that culminates in the cross, uh, it just, um, it's a big deal. It's a big, big, big deal, and, uh, and it's just exciting. Today, we're talking about Thursday. Now, some people call it Holy Thursday. Some people just call it Thursday. Uh, some folks call it Monday, Thursday, and, uh, and and that might confuse you. You know, the, the, uh, within our churches, and when I say our churches, I mean Restoration churches, the Churches of Christ, uh, Independent Churches of Christ, uh, and uh, Instrumental uh, Churches of Christ, and Independent Christian churches. Um, we kind of have an identity. But uh, we're starting to change quite a bit because as time goes by, we're getting folks from all kinds of traditions that are coming to us. And some folks who sit in the pew, they understand exactly what Monday, Thursday is. Uh, they, they come from a tradition or a background where they've talked about it, they know about it. Uh, Passion Week, Holy Week is a big deal to them. Uh, they, they start Ash Wednesday, go get uh, ashes on their forehead on Ash Wednesday for Lent. Uh, all those things take place, but then there's a vast percentage of people within our churches who know nothing about it uh, because they come from, from traditions that um, 
don't necessarily reject it, they just observe it differently. And, uh, and so you find yourself as a minister nowadays just doing a whole lot of basic teaching, what I would think is basic teaching. Um, and mostly it's just so we can see what it is from somebody else's perspective. So what is Maundy? What is Monday Thursday? Now that word, Monday, is uh, corruption. It's a variation of actually a Latin term. And that Latin term is what gives us the word for mandate. That Latin term means command. And it has to do with these two verses. Uh, so, so I'll introduce this to you. We'll get to them in the middle of the sermon. But Monday, Thursday has everything to do with this new command. A new command I give you, this is Jesus speaking, to his disciples, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So that is the two verses that make Monday, Thursday, Monday, Thursday, or Monday, Thursday. Um, what's the big deal? Well, here's another big portion of this, or a big deal, is we're calling this Thursday, but I have to clarify a few things. As we take and teach about this, you have to remember that uh, for much of what we're going to read uh, today for our lesson, that actually technically from the disciples' point of view is Friday. Their Thursday would have started from sundown on Wednesday until sundown on Thursday. Other than this introductory passage that we're going to have here in a second as they're preparing for the Passover, that did happen technically on their Thursday. And I say that because they would not have even agreed because there would have been some who were from more of a Roman or Greek background who would have measured the day as from sunup to sunup. So the Romans would have considered Thursday uh, if it started this morning and it goes until tomorrow morning. The Jewish uh, believers would have considered it Thursday, but only from sundown to sundown. And then we really mess things up with our understanding because we consider it from, what, midnight to midnight. That's the view we're going to take today. We're going to talk about what happens after sundown at that Passover Seder that they're having or that Passover meal. There's even debate about that, but we'll get to that in a second. And this is where Jesus introduces to his disciples as he's giving them the parting words, the parting wisdom. He's preparing them to take over the ministry. He leaves them with this command, these two verses, uh, and, uh, and we observe that 2,000 years later still. And it's all wrapped around those two verses, all of it, that is not only his command, but also his, uh, his actions that night, his teachings that night, John 13, 14, 15, and 16 is what he taught them that night, John 17, he prayed that that night, and that's in addition to the prayer that he had in the Garden of Gethsemane, and, uh, and, and we also need to keep in mind Jesus likely never slept from when he woke up that Thursday until he died on the cross that Friday. This is a big deal. So let's start off and look at it as to what happened on that, that day. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and make preparation, preparations for you to eat the Passover. Now, uh, uh, another big debate is when did this happen? What year? Is this 30 AD, as uh, many believe? Or is it AD 33 or is it AD 36? Those are the three big years where they try and reconcile all these dates. Part of it is built upon when did Passover start because it would have been on the 14th of Nisan and which one of those years best fits everything that happens. Uh, one of the things that, uh, uh, that uh, scholars take into consideration is 
they had a tendency to call everything in those eight days Passover. So they had a tendency to refer to the pre-Passover meal and the Passover meal as Passover. And, uh, and that confuses us sometimes 2,000 years later. Long story short, Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He rose again on the third day. And it doesn't matter what year it was, it happened, right? And we can debate it, all of it, as much as we want to. But the truth is, that's what really matters. We're just trying to catch up, aren't we? And that's what happened. On that first day, it's time for the Passover meal, and, the, and it's time for them to deal with making that Passover meal. So verse 13, and the scripture we're using here is a harmony of the Gospels. So verse 13, so he sent two of his disciples, Luke tells us it's Peter and John, telling them, go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Now, it seems like Jesus has is, is definitely got some knowledge beforehand, or maybe this is arranged. He actually knows this person is going to be carrying a jar. That would have been unusual for a man to be carrying a jar uh, because it would be a woman's job in their culture. Verse 14, say to the owner of the house he enters, the teacher asks, my appointed time is near. Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room furnished and ready make preparations for us there. So based upon those verses, it seems as if Jesus has already had this prearranged with the owner. Verse 16, the disciples left, went into the city, and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Again, just so we have a sense, the, a feel of how they did things, we, we have to divorce ourselves from our nature of doing things, and that would have been that dinner was at a table that sat about 30 inches off of the ground, and they would have sat in chairs. No, they didn't. Their table would have been maybe 6 to 8 inches off the ground. They would have been on these lounges that are a little like a, you know, a, a, an outdoor lounge that you would have. They would have rested on their left arm because they could not eat with their left hand. That was your dirty hand. Your clean hand would have been your right hand. And they would have dipped from a common bowl on that table. That's the scene. Their feet, their feet would have been stretched out past them away from the table. And, uh, and they would also arrange things so that honored guests would be next to the big guest. Uh, Jesus would be the big guest. He'd be the big personalities. And, uh, and the other disciples would be placed around him. So that's the setting. Not like our setting, but like theirs. The disciples left, verse 16, went into the city, found things just as Jesus had told them, so they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, for I tell you I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. So that's the setting. And he's just let them know this is how it's going to be, but also... Things are going to change with you guys. He's given us a hint, giving them a hint as to what's going on. So what happens next? Now, before we go to this next scene, and uh, except for the very last passage, we're going to go back to just regular scriptures. You can open up your Bible if you want to. We're going to be in Luke 22 at this point. But uh, uh, at this point, and what happens next, you just need to remember that we are all humans after all. I also want to remind you of these boys that Jesus has been hanging around with for three and a half years. For, for lack of a better term, they are just young men. They're probably, some of them are probably still teenagers. And uh, in three and a half years, we've seen them make a lot of mistakes. And it seems like they continue to make mistakes. And this is just before Jesus is crucified. But this, uh, this scene, what we're going to read this morning, very much highlights the lesson that I think God is trying to give us today. And that is something to think about. 
Scripture, to me, when I take and I read Scripture, and, and, and we step away from just overanalyzing and taking the heart out of it, here's what Scripture is to me. It is God communicating to a fallen humanity, and he knows us better than anyone else. So he uses language like no one else uses. He's beautiful in his creation of language. But also you see these many layers of things that happen that just highlight that an intelligence far greater than ours is trying to communicate a message to us and arrange things in a way that should astound us. Everything that happens on that Thursday is just what I've described. It is God creating a painting. It's God creating a story. It's God laying out a plan that's been in place for thousands of years before man was ever even dreamed of. God is setting this scene in place so that we can believe that he is God and that Jesus is the Christ. So here's the arrangement. Look at what happens next as the backdrop for those two verses. A new command I give you, love one another. Luke chapter 22, verse 24. A dispute, an argument, a fight, a disagreement. However you want to think of it, the boys are not behaving well right now. It's kind of like that car ride to church in the morning and you've got kids and they're fighting and you're tempted to pull over to the side of the road and say, now you kids, if you don't stop, I'm going to pull this car over and give you the beating of your life or however. Just imagine Jesus in control of these, uh, these feisty boys. So a dispute also arose among them as to which of them was considered to be what? Greatest. Does that sound like these guys have listened to Jesus for three and a half years? Now, again, we need a little background. We need a little backdrop. And one of the things to remember is uh, it is easy to maybe excuse them a little bit. They're caught up in the moment. They were scared for the last month to two months as Jesus was getting closer and closer to Jerusalem. They were scared for him because they knew the Jewish leadership was out to kill him. They knew it. They had warned him, hey, don't go to Jerusalem. But he goes anyway, and when he arrives in Jerusalem on that Sunday, on that triumphal entry, they get caught up in it. Everybody's cheering. Everybody is convinced that this Jesus is the Christ, that he is the Messiah, but they're thinking a king. They're thinking a military power. That he's going to assume the throne of David, that Rome is going to be thrown off. They're just... They're thinking of glory days. And it's likely that the disciples get caught up in all that energy. Yes, it had been a pretty powerful week. Monday and Tuesday, there was the, the conflict at the temple and the conflict with the Jewish leadership. But still, he's getting, Jesus is getting more and more and more popular with the people. It's crazy. And so they can almost feel, maybe, that Jesus is going to assume the throne. And if he's going to be king, if he's going to assume a throne, who most likely is going to be his cabinet? Who's going to be his chief of staff? Who's going to be his, uh, his uh, uh, press secretary? Who's going to be, well, you get the idea. And so here they are, they're fighting. They're arguing, they're debating. Yeah, who's it going to be? Is it going to be you, Peter? No, you stick your foot in your mouth all the time. It's going to be me, John. He loves me more than anybody else. Right? Can you see the argument? Verse 25. And again, this is a backdrop. Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. So this is the way the rest of the world works, guys. Don't let this be your framework for how my kingdom's going to work. Because you know how the Gentiles work. Their kings do horrible things. They use their power, and then they have the audacity to label themselves as good guys, benefactors. 
Verse 26, but you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the run, one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. Here's a great big clue right there. You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you a kingdom. See, there's the first big hint in the midst of this. He's giving them the ministry, but it's not going to be the ministry they think it is. I confer on you a kingdom just as my father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And that likely is a prophecy even far into our future. It's when Christ returns. What they could not understand was that this was going to be a spiritual kingdom, that there would be no borders. There's no flags. There's no line in some sand on some beach somewhere that says this kingdom ends here. No, Christ's kingdom is limitless. It's forever. It's different. And what happens next, and remember, we're going through this chronologically. We're leaving out a lot. We're not going to study all of John 13, 14, 15, 16, and we're definitely not going to get into his prayer or any of the things that happen on up until midnight. We're just going to focus on a couple of things that highlight for us why this would be our mandate, our command Thursday. And so this that happens next is incredible. And so just before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And in Greek, that one's a tough one to translate. It's this teleos. It's that, that Greek word that keeps coming up, and it means, it means not just uh, when it's finished, it's when it's complete. It's, it's a powerful lot of meaning to it, and he's using it to talk about John is. He's using it to talk about Christ's capacity for love, particularly with the disciples. I would just say, maybe the best way to rephrase it is Jesus loved them better than we've ever been loved before. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. What he's about to do is astounding. It's amazing. It's incredible, and here's why. There's absolutely, positively, the most stunning thing Jesus may have ever done, even up to maybe dying on the cross for us. Because in their culture, the lowest of the low would do what he's about to do. There's no way anybody with any sort of, of, of honor, any sort of prestige, any sort of, of status would do what Jesus is about to do. As he takes that towel and he's taking off his outer clothing and he gets the pitcher and he gets the bowl and he washes their feet. This is the act of humi humility that maybe it's only through this we can understand the cross. So he's got this towel. He's got it wrapped around himself. He came to Simon Peter, of all people, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize what I am doing. But later, you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, 
being Simon Peter and that open mouth, insert foot, bite off at the hip sort of person that he was. Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. And Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. You are clean, though not every one of you. And of course, that's a reference to Judas. John fills us in, for he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place and asked a profound question that we're going to ask ourselves, of ourselves. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. And a teacher and a Lord would not wash the feet of those lower than him in class. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I would assume that even though John is the one who gives us this story, I think this is probably talked about among the disciples and taught to the churches throughout history. I would believe that this greatly influenced Paul in addition to the Holy Spirit, and he would be able to write Philippians 2 and pen of Jesus' humility, that he humbled himself even to the point of the cross, that he became a servant even to us. I mean, we're talking about God, the Son of God, who gets down on his knees and washes the nasty feet of these young men who deserve none of that. And in verse 15, he tells them what it's all about. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. I'm not referring to all of you. I know those I have chosen. But this is to fulfill this passage of Scripture. He who shared my bread is turned against me. And again, another reference to Judas and his betrayal. I am telling you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am who I am. Very truly, I tell you, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me, and whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. So here's our big point, our big question. Not everyone got it in that room. As a matter of fact, it's doubtful any of them got it, that they understood what Jesus was doing. They did later on. I mean, it, it took the cross, it took the resurrection in order for them to understand that they truly had God in their midst and that God had just washed their feet. But do you? Do you understand what Jesus did and that command that he served as an example for us. That our attitude within the church, what the church needs to be about, what the church needs to do is be a place of servants, not those who are served. And I guess one of the best ways to ask the question is, really, when we do things, which side of the bowl are you most likely on? And, and here's what I mean by that. Are you on the side of the bowl where someone else is serving you and washing your feet? Are you on the side of the bowl where you're the one with the towel and you're the one that's washing others' feet? Now, most of us, and, and, and particularly, and I love this congregation, we have so many servant attitudes. We have so many that are willing to just do extraordinary things. But could we every once in a while be guilty of having the attitude of, but I deserve this. I should be served. And I've heard it. Believe me, over the years, especially since, since I, I just believe God has laid it on, uh, on the burden, uh, has laid the, the, the challenge on me to serve in predominantly smaller congregations. I mean, we started in a larger congregation. But you find in smaller congregations, you're far more likely to hear people depart. And 
And one of the reasons people depart is to go to a larger congregation. And other than, well, you offended me, which is pretty common. Most of the time, it's, well, but they have so many programs. They have so much going on. <coughs> Every once in a while, you even hear extraordinary things like folks who have uh, just kind of uh, spent a lot of time getting benevolence from your small congregation. And, uh, and it's not just benevolence, but also this idea that, hey, you know, uh, you need to grow in this. Let's get you to the point you can learn how to take care of yourself. So then they will say things like, well, we're going to a congregation that will help us more. And it amazes me that people would say things like that. But also, what about, what about the things that we say sometimes that we don't even really truly think through? Well, I've done my work in the church. It's time for me to retire now. My understanding of what Scripture says is, here's when we Christians retire, when you breathe your last, and you cross over, and he puts the crown of righteousness on, you retire then. Up until then, every one of us is working. By the way, giving, everything else goes with that. It doesn't stop magically at some point that you reach that U.S. Social Security age of 65, and all of a sudden you can stop. That's not what Scripture teaches, is it? No, it is always this side of the towel, isn't it? That we've got it draped over our, our arm. That we've, we've got this attitude of, here, how may I serve? So do you see now how God has painted this picture that God, the Son of God, the Christ, the Messiah, is sitting with these humble men and he is preparing them, even though they have just argued about who's greatest in the kingdom. He is preparing them for a life of servitude. In John 13, 14, 15, 16, he will tell them of the great things that are to come, and that is his kingdom and the ministry that they have before them. But he will also share for them a picture of persecution, wrongdoing done against them, cursings, hurt, pain. It's going to be a miserable life if you measure it by this life. And against that backdrop, he then finally says this to them. Just a few verses after what we've just read, a new command I give you, love one another, as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Man, that's a profound statement, isn't it? That Jesus, just before he breathes his last on the cross, has served the people who have been his disciples, his students, for three and a half years. He's taken, and we're going to leave this on display, but he's taken this model of a towel and a pitcher and a bowl to teach them that none of us is better than the other. That if the Son of God himself can do something as humble as this, and we can't complain about anything that we're called to do. Can we? No. Um, this week, so, uh, interesting things happened. Uh, I mean, since Joe and Amanda aren't here, and I'm hoping they don't actually watch the sermon, since they're not here, I, I have to tell a story on Joe and Amanda. They came to us from a large church. It was one of those reversal sort of things. Came to us from another church. And they're the ones who did these cards without being asked. They've also started to take over the Facebook page and the website, and they're putting stuff on there. It's great having young people who know how to use the computer because they're just doing it, and they're the ones who are volunteering. Joe is carving uh, out of foam. He's carving our empty tomb that we're going to put up. Uh, I mean, that's all pretty cool, isn't it? But I... I have to tell you, I was a little suspicious when they first came. 
I was really kind of wondering because I know their minister. I know which church they came from. And there was a part of me that was thinking they're doing it backwards. Uh, and there's a part of me that would have thought, well, actually, if I was the pastor at a church of 1,000 or 2,000, I'd probably do this anyway. I thought their minister was likely had the attitude, had a program that they were taking people from their excess and sending them out to smaller churches to help other churches up. In other words, to be servants and help the body of Christ grow from within. That's what I would do. I don't think it's a great idea to be a church of 2,000 and grow it for the purpose of being 4,000. I think it's great to grow to 2,000 or 1,000 or 500 or whatever the number is and then realize that you have a wealth of talent, you have a wealth of servants and you send them off to smaller congregations to help them out. And that's a servant attitude, isn't it? And knowing their ministry, I wouldn't put it past them, but I'll take what I'll get. But I also see phenomenal things this week too. Thursday morning had breakfast with ministers from 30 plus different congregations who all had breakfast together and were about as many different brands as you can think of. Which is just another way of saying different traditions or we believe different things. We're not all on the same page on all things. But we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and he's our Lord and our Savior. That we agree on. And so what you have is 30 plus churches that are getting together and they're going to do the Convoy of Hope again this year. August 26, put it on your calendar, 9 to 1. Yep. Last year we had 1,700 people that we served. The estimate is it'll be like 3,500 guests. And it's the church being servants. Those people come in and they're not people we're helping know they are honored guests. They're going to give away shoes, and they're going to try, this last time they gave away shoes to the kids, now they're going to try and do kids and the moms too. 3,000 pairs of shoes, the budget for that by itself is $30,000. By the way, the budget this year is $60,000, they've already raised $27,000. And for those of us who kind of think, well, because of my limitations, because of this or that or whatever, I can't really do things. It's too hard for me to walk. I've got to do this. You know, you know. There's even plans for folks who are in those situations, and you can serve too, because one of the stations is the prayer station, and you can sit at this prayer station. You don't have to move. You don't have to climb. You don't have to step up or do anything like that, you can do one of the most priceless things there are. You can sit down and you can pray with someone else about the challenges that are going on in their life that they share with you. Or better yet, you can share Jesus with them. Any one of us is capable of that. We just need not a serve me attitude. Rather, we need an attitude of let me serve. You step on this side of the towel rather than the other side of the towel. So we've got it, don't we, the backdrop. We've got the, the, the verse, that the command for Monday, Thursday. But you know, it also includes the frame, and here it is. We're going to go back to that chronological life of Christ. Break open your communion. Go ahead and get that out. Yeah, we're talking about the Lord's Supper, communion. Four voices in Scripture give us a picture of this. And what's amazing is the amount they, they agree. Matthew and Mark are almost the same voice. It's, it's almost as if they wrote each other's passage. Interestingly enough, Luke and Paul also agree in their recollection of events. But this is Jesus on that night, and it's at that Passover meal, and this happens. Luke chapter 22, verse 17. After taking the cup. There's four cups that are involved in the Passover meal. This is likely the second one. 
After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you, for I tell you I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. But now we get to this third cup. In the same way, after supper, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, in remembrance of me. And they all drank from it. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many in the forgiveness of sins. In other words, the, the one who should be served is the servant. The one who should be honored is honoring us. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. And then Paul adds this, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That is the Lord's Supper. That is communion. But that backdrop, that Passover meal, that painting that God has put for us, and we'll get a reminder of this at the Seder meal. Just want to remind you of these four cups. That last cup is probably the one that Jesus is not going to partake of until we gather together probably at the great messianic feast, the great, the great buff, uh, banquet with the bride and the groom together, is likely the fourth cup. And they go like this. First cup at the Passover meal is normally downstairs or it's, it's with the hors d'oeuvres. And they would recite these words, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. But then they would get to the meal, and that second cup, which we made reference to, and they would quote these words, I will free you from being slaves to them. For us, it's God's promise that he's freeing us from the slavery of sin. And then that third cup, that third cup that's at the end of the meal, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with a mighty axe of judgment. See, this cross bought us back, didn't it? And then that fourth cup, that promised cup, that messianic banquet cup, likely. There's differences of opinion, but this fits, doesn't it? Listen to the words. It's so beautiful. We do this weekly. We do this in remembrance of Christ that we Christians have a Passover meal every time we gather. But look at the beauty of the fourth cup that Jesus is waiting to drink with us when he comes back to get us. I will take you as my own people and I will be your God. Isn't that beautiful? A new command I give you, love one another. It's not a serve me attitude. It's how may I serve you. So Father, as we take this bread, as we break it, as we consider the beauty of that day and the beauty of our redemption, we give thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. And in this cup, we drink it over and over and over again because we need constant reminders because we are so much like those knothead teenagers that sat there at that table and argued about who is greatest. We need a reminder just how not great we are, don't we? Father, we give you thanks for this cup, for this blood oath, this covenant, for this washing in blood it just means so much to us. We give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's stand and be dismissed. I want to remind you that Wes and Anna will be up here for prayer. 
Uh, be in prayer for our sister Michelle. She's hurting right now, and she just needs your and covets your prayers. Father, as we go out these doors, may we be servants to all. Father, let us not have the attitude that whoever is before us is there to serve us. Rather, you have apportioned the time. You have given us a divine appointment that we are to be servant to them. How may I serve? In Jesus' name, amen. You all be blessed. Have a great day.